A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim I start in the name of Allah the Beneficent and the Merciful I seek salvation from Shaitan the Accursed My dearest viewers brothers and sisters from all across the world Assalamu Alaikum Jamian wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh May the peace blessings and the protection of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala be with you at all times Welcome to another episode of the Ramadan show with me your host Dr Shabir Tijani Inshallah, we hope to be a one-stop shop for this holy month and we hope that we can impart a few pearls of wisdom that you can use on your day-to-day -day life for this holy month and for the rest of the year, Inshallah. I would like to remind you to send in your videos, your pictures, your blogs from around the world to tell us how you prepare for this holy month. And please join us on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook and on YouTube, Inshallah. Before proceeding on to the show, I would like to just repeat a saying from Amir al-Mu'minin where he says a person would have long grief or a person's grief would be long when their hope is short. This is saying to us that when you are in times of grief, when you have bad things, bad experiences happen to you, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put, his, put your hope in Him. And when you put your hope in Him, just leave all of your matters up to Him. That way your grief will be minimized, inshaAllah. We hope that through these nights of Shah Ramadan, your bond and our bond in fact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets very strong, so strong that we can put all of our burdens onto Him and leave it up to Him to deal with them. this episode and in this segment of spiritual refinement inshallah with the day of Eid coming up Eid al-Fitr I wanted to talk a little bit about this special day so that we could truly get ourselves ready for it understand the value of it understand the station of it we've all fasted for this whole month inshallah and we've achieved spiritual enlightenment at the end of the road we want this Ramadan this month to be the beginning of a new start for us and Eid is the marker for that new start, insha'Allah. Eid al-Fitr obviously marks the end of the holy month of Ramadan. We say farewell to this blessed month, its beautiful days, its fragrant nights. We leave the month of seeking nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the school of Iman and an opportunity to recharge our spiritual batteries. That is not to say we can't continue the things we've learned through this holy month throughout the rest of the year. In these nights that have just passed, we prayed, we offered charities, and we attended lectures. So what's going to happen now? The question we have to ask ourselves is, have we fulfilled the requirements of taqwa and graduated the school with a diploma in God-fearing? Then you have to ask yourself, have you done these nights just? Have you done everything you wanted to do in these nights? Have you achieved your goals that you set out to achieve throughout these nights? And has these nights improved you or increased your spirituality? The night of Eid al-Fitr is a majestic night. It is beneficial to keep awake in ibadah as this night is equal to the importance of that of the night of power, Laylatul Qadr. When we think of Eid, Obviously, a lot of people think of this as something that marks the end of the holy month of Ramadan. However, I want you to change your thinking about this and consider it a new beginning, a fresh start, where we emulate our character and Islamic values and we build upon what we've learned in the last 30 days or 30 nights. We want to try and improve ourselves. We're on a spiral towards perfection. Over the last 30 nights, inshallah, I hope that we've achieved something, we have gone on this journey, we've started our thousand mile journey with a single step, but we have to continue walking in order to make that destination. 
We are like a child. It is said that on the day of Eid, we're like a child who's just come out of the womb, pure and innocent. Eid is the day of victory as we have succeeded in subduing our desires and purified our souls. Let's not wash away our good deeds. Let's not revert back to our old ways. The masjid in this holy month was overflowing. The masjid was filled. And let's continue that. Let's continue keep, to keep our masjids full of people, full of worshippers. Let the Qur'an be the most essential part of our lives. Let's not let it gather dust on the shelves as it's been doing for the past few months. Our condition now should be better than it was at the begin, beginning of the month. And inshallah, we hope that by the time for next Ramadan, if you're able to make that journey, if life per permits, that you're better than even you are now and you've improved yourself, you've built upon these 30 nights and you've improved yourself as a human being. A lot of us consider Eid just to be another day, another ritualistic day, a traditional day where we get together and eat and we get dressed in good clothes and we give presents to each other. But there is such a more profound meaning to that special day. There is a spiritualistic side to the day of Eid. You see, it represents important values in participating in them. We seek the pleasure of Almighty Allah and try to attain nearness to Him. There is a narration where Imam Hassan salam saw a man on the day of Eid who had occupied his time with laughter and useless entertainment. The holy Imam turned to his companion and said, Allah placed the holy month of Ramadan so people, for people so that they can compete, compete with each other in worship and obedience. In this competition some excel, achieve unlimited blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore win the competition whereas others fall back, lose and obtain nothing but losses. It is striking that in such a day in which the righteous and the hard workers will receive great rewards and the culpable and ones who do not try their be best will see a loss, that they keep themselves busy with entertainment. From this you can understand from what the holy and the great Imam is saying, that on this day, even though it's important to celebrate, get together with your family, you have the right to enjoy good food, you have the right to have fun, but like we've said in the previous nights, you should always put Allah as your first priority, seek nearness to Him. And remember what the day of Eid is for in its entirety. It is not a day where you can forget what you've been doing over the past 30 days and 30 nights. It is not a day where you can just entertain yourself with things of this worldly, um, sinful world. It is not a day where you can forget everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt have taught us. Eid al-Fitr serves many purposes. And inshallah, before moving on to the next segment, I just want to go into some of these purposes that it serves. Primarily, the first reason why we have the day of Eid is to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to thank Him for the endurance and for the strength He's given us during these days of Ramadan. If you think about some parts of the world where it's very, very hot, or some parts of the world where the days are so long and you think to yourself, how did I manage all of that? How did I manage to fast for that period of time or in that climate? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always prov provides sustenance or sustenance to his lovers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the spiritual strength to continue through these days. If you think about how you are feeling, the pangs of hunger you are feeling on the first day of, of, of the month of Ramadan, and the pangs of hunger you feel over the past two or three days, you'll realize that at the moment you feel much more calmer. You don't feel as hungry as you used to. Eid al-Fitr is also a day where brotherhood is built. It is a day when people come together in congregation and pray together, stand shoulder to shoulder with each other. They demonstrate equality. And inshallah, this will form the moral fabric for the rest of time to come and for our society. We also think about another significance of the day of Eid, where it is obligatory on everyone to give charity to the poor. We shouldn't just take this as a single day where we give charity. Giving to the needy is an incumbent obligation on every true believer. 
You should make this a guide or a template for yourself that you should continue to do month after month, day after day for the rest of the year. Continue to give to the poor, whether it's once every day, once a week, once a month, so that you can continue this ongoing good act that you've developed in, during this day. Having done this for one whole month, today is an auspicious day. We should be ready to face the year that lies ahead with strength, greater understanding and more goodwill. We should consider ourselves better human beings and consider ourselves close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The problem is when you leave or when this month has gone away and you go back into your old ways, the sins start taking over the good deeds again and everything that you've built up in this month soon fades away. So you must be steadfast, you must endeavor to continue the good work that you've been doing. You see, this month of Ramadan, when it comes to sports, you train for a big event. And you should consider this month of Ramadan as a training period. A training period for the rest of the year, where you have to continue the good work. Now, you enjoy in your daily activities, your normal life. But you must always constantly think about the lessons you've learned in this month of Ramadan. You see, we've tried to develop good traits, good qualities, tried to learn good habits. Don't let that all go to waste, otherwise you've got nothing out, out of this holy month. Insha'Allah, I hope that these last few nights have been inspiring for you. I hope that you're a better person now than you were at the begin, beginning of the month of Ramadan. And insha'Allah, I pray that when the next Ramadan comes, if God permits, then you'll be an even better person than you are today. Inshallah, we'll continue tomorrow talking about the aspects of Eid al-Fitr and there'll be a short recap about all the other spiritual refinement that we've been talking about. Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, was asked, O Prophet of Allah, which of the two months possesses a greater reward, Rajab or the month of Ramadan? The Holy Prophet, may the peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny, replied, Nothing can be compared to the month of Ramadan in terms of reward. this episode, inshallah, we'll be talking about how people from around the world prepare for the month of Ramadan. And tonight we're going to a city which is very close to where I live actually, and that is Birmingham in the United Kingdom. Birmingham is a city which is found in the middle of the country, in the area called the Midlands. And it's an area which has a very multicultural society, lots of Muslims from very different backgrounds, and the Shia community there as well, which consists of the Khoja, the Indo-Pakistani community, and the Iraqi community. In Birmingham, there are workshops held every night for the young children so that they can go and learn things. Things that are aimed at their level and targeted towards them directly. And it's like a class that they can go to and they can do specific activities directly aimed for the kids. For the adults, every night there is lectures, majalis within the centers and they exist in two languages, English and in the language, the mother tongue of whichever community is there. And English is a very important language to the people there because obviously a lot of the youth don't understand the language or the mother tongue that they come from and as a result they require English so that they can understand what is being said. Every night within the center there's iftar and because of the timings of iftar and maghrib what happens is that if the maghrib is very late the lectures and the dua happen before the time of maghrib so everybody by the time iftar is done is ready for home. Whereas on Fridays and Saturdays, because there's no school or work on the day after, the, uh, the dua and the a'mal is done after the time of iftar. As the United Kingdom is a non-Muslim country, the government do not change the working hours. So people continue to work their usual lives and their usual routines. 
and that doesn't really change. So people try to make use of the mosque and the iftar at mosque so that they don't have to take time to prepare the food in the evenings and therefore allows them to free up time for other things such as a'mal and dua and for spiritual enlightenment. The interesting thing about Birmingham, due to the fact that it's in the United Kingdom and the people there are from a very diverse, even within one community, very diverse backgrounds and they do taqlid of different maraja and as a result the Knights of the Layal al-Qadr, the Knights of Power differ from people to people depending on who they follow and therefore after the 19th night onwards every night there is a'mal in the mosque and people are welcome to come in and join and participate so people can come together and there's a kinship and brotherhood and galvanization of the community due to the fact that everyone gets together for the a'mal. I would like to ask you once again to send in your videos, your picture, your blogs to our channel so we can air them, we can see how you prepare for the month of Ramadan. And we hope that this will allow us to get an insight into how varied the practices are throughout the world. But we remember one thing and that is whatever practices we have, traditions and cultures we have, the aim, the goal, the objective never changes. And that is that we fast and we do things, we have our cultural traditions for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Respected viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace and blessings and protection of Allah be upon each and every one of you Today again we came to one of the marketplaces in the holy city of Karbala to show you what is going on during the holy month of Ramadan in the place in the store markets here in the holy city of Karbala viewers let's have a word with one of the brothers here salam alaikum alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh allah yahfidhak mumkin tatfadhal lana an ajwa' madinat karbala khilal shahr ramadan al mubarak awalan ahlan wa sahlan bikum wa ahlan wa sahlan qanat al imam al husayn madinat karbala fi ramadan ila khususiya khususiya jameela barakat al imam al husayn abul fadl al abbas ajwa' karbala jameela takun fi waqt yani ba'da al fatur ajwa' kullu jameela تعرف انت قبل الفطور هنا يعني وجبات فطور تصير في شارع الامام الحسين مجانا طبعا للصائمين توزيع واجواء جميله جدا جميله. The brother is saying that uh, the holy month of Ramadan in the holy city of Karbala is so special uh, due to the blessings of Imam Al Hussein and his brother Abu Al Fadl Al Abbas uh, and here in front of their store uh, usually before the iftar uh, every day they have uh, a gathering and in which they serve the visitors of Abi Abdullah al Hussein with iftar uh, during the holy month of Ramadan. نعم ممكن تتفضلن عن عملكم خلال شهر رمضان المبارك يعني تتأثر عملكم ساعاتكم تتغير لو شلون؟ عملنا ما يتأثر يعني الحمد لله والشكر بالعكس هو قلت لك شهر رمضان شهر خير وبركة يعني كل من يقول لك مثلا شهر رمضان يتأثر العمل وهذا لا الحمد لله والشكر. يعني احنا كنا قبل نعزل مثلا بثمانية او بتسعه سنه بقل الوحده يعني الحمد لله وشكر فما يتغير كل شيء ما يتغير والرزق يزود والحمد لله وشكر هو قلت لك شهر خير شهر, شهر طاعه شهر جدا جميل هو شهر يعني بكل معنى الكلمه فقط I ask the brother about uh, their their job uh, they do here uh, during the holy month of Ramadan and he's saying that uh, due to the blessings of this month uh, alhamdulillah the job is uh, going very well here uh, and uh, their working hour they he's saying that uh, instead of working till uh, the dusk prayers until the iftar uh, they are staying up until uh, 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning every day
In today's episode, as we go through the stages of life, inshallah in this episode of the health tips and medical advice, I want to talk about old age and the elderly within our communities. I want to talk about, number one, the um, problems associated with old age. Number two, the medical conditions associated with old age. Number three, what we can do as a community for the elderly within our communities. One of the biggest problems with old age is frailty and that's caused by degeneration of the human body over time. So if you can imagine that the hearts and the lungs aren't what they once used to be, the joints, the muscles, take due to the test of time, degenerate. And I've talked about arthritis in previous episode, I will be talking about it in a future episode. And as a result, these joint problems and muscle problems make the old people, they find them difficult to walk, and elderly find it difficult to walk rather. And they find it difficult to walk long distances and they get tired very quickly. So it's important to understand that. And also with the elderly people, as you can imagine, the longer you live, the more likely it is that you'll develop medical problems. So they have a lot of other complex medical issues associated with their old age. So it's important to appreciate that as a community and as a society and also try and accommodate for that. Give them support and help when they need it. Talking about the elderly, conditions that are more prevalent and illnesses that are more prevalent in, in older age are things like dementia. Dementia I've talked about in a previous episode, but I think it's important as a community that we appreciate the effects of dementia and acknowledge that it's a condition that is getting more and more prevalent within our communities. Inshallah, when we do that, we can then start to address it. Secondly, one of the conditions that affects the brain is something called Parkinson's disease. It's a condition which is caused by damage to or degeneration of a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. And this affects things like movement. People with Parkinson's typically get symptoms like tremors, they get rigidity of their muscles, and they get slowing of the movements or the initiation of movements. They find problems moving and walking. They find problems writing. And if you notice all of these, then it's important that you see your GP because people who suffer from these can be treated with medication. And with medication, obviously, their symptoms can subside. Other problems affect affecting the elderly are things like visual problems, things like macular degeneration or cataracts, and hearing problems. As degeneration happens with the ears, they get poorer hearing. Obviously, with people who suffer from these problems, it's important to see eye specialists or opticians, and also it's important to see people who are specialists with hearing. You can get treated f with surgery for cataracts, for example, and treatment with hearing aids for hearing problems, for example. Thereafter, there are problems with the rest of the body, so the main organs of the body, things like the heart and the kidneys and the lungs. And if you suffer from degeneration of these and worsening of these in terms of their function, you can see a doctor and the doctor will keep an eye on you, do regular checkups maybe once every six months, maybe once every year and give you medication to try and help with these ailments of the body. Finally, cancers are more prevalent in elder, elderly people. Reason being is that in the elderly, as time de goes on and the body degenerates, the cells of the body also degenerate and they're more prone to getting cancerous. So things like prostate cancer in men, um, lung cancer, thyroid cancers, and um, bowel cancers are more prevalent in the elderly population. And therefore, it's important to look out for the signs and the symptoms which may lead you or indicate that there is a problem going on. So the symptoms include things like weight loss, very large amounts of weight loss over a short period of time, uh, things like loss of appetite, problems with uh, colors, uh, color of the skin, so if someone's looking very pale and feeling tired all the time, if you're getting all these symptoms, and especially with bowel cancers, if you find that you find blood in your stools, or in lung cancer, if you find that you find blood in your mucus when you're coughing up, it's important to get these seen and see a doctor as soon as possible because even though the elderly population may be very frail and they have these problems, it's not to say that they can't have an operation or they can't get these problems treated. So the quicker you see them, the quicker you act on them, and the, and the quicker that you um, treat them, the better the prognosis is in the long term. Finally, I just want to talk about what we can do as a community to try and help the elderly. And also, by helping the elderly, we're helping ourselves. So things like, number one, as a community, I feel that because of the elderly within our population and those with mobility problems, I think within our mosques and Husseiniyas, within our centers, we should have mobility aids there as, as um, there just in case, as a course of precaution, in case there's someone who's old who doesn't have their walking stick with them 
or someone who's old and they're finding it difficult to mobilize through, uh, around the mosque, for example. It's important to have some walking sticks and some frames there just in case. Secondly, I feel that as a community we need to acknowledge the problems associated with old age. And I think we should try and have seminars and education sessions so we can educate the members of our community regarding those who are elderly and what we can do to help them. Thirdly, I think one of the most important things for elderly people is social interaction. If you imagine a lot of them are past retirement age, so they sit at home whilst the rest of the family maybe go to work or go to school and they don't have people they can talk to. So as a community, I think we should introduce um, sessions or um, gatherings for the elderly. I know in some communities they have something called senior citizens meetings where the elderly get together in these meetings they can have social interaction, develop their interests with each other and thirdly if there's any problems that they have they can discuss it and problems can be flagged up very quickly. Fourth and lastly I want to just encourage members of our community, the young, the middle-aged to go and visit care homes, to visit nursing homes, to help the elderly in society, not only the Muslims but also the non-Muslims that way we appreciate, number one, the problems associated with old age. Number two, we give them social interaction, something that the elderly actually crave. Number three, it's not only good for them, but it's good for us as well. They have such a wealth of knowledge, such experience that they can give us advice as well. And number five, I think with the elderly, if we look after them as we age, and our youngsters also help to look after them, as we age as a population, the youths will start looking after us. They'll have the values and the appreciation for the elderly within their hearts. If you just ignore the elderly and pretend they don't exist in society, when we get to that stage, the same will happen to us. So it's important to try and build that. It forms the basic fabric of society. Inshallah, I hope that these pointers have been useful for you. Inshallah, I hope that as a community, we can strive to appreciate the elderly more and to help them and by helping them, we're helping ourselves. Helping the elderly and giving them appreciation, value in society forms the moral fabric of society. And I've said, as I've said before, if you can help the elderly improve their self-confidence and self-esteem, allow them to impart their wisdom, impart their experience to you, you can learn so much. And as a community, we can build the foundations for the evolution and for the improvement of our own communities, inshallah, I hope that our communities can grow from strength to strength and the youth of our community can become the flag bearers of the religion of Islam and also become the soldiers for the awaited Imam alayhi salam. Once when our ninth Imam, Imam Muhammad at taqi peace be upon him, when he was nine years old, he was walking down the street in Baghdad when Ma'mun al-Rashid and his soldiers were passing by. All the children that were playing on the street ran away except for the Imam. Noting this, Ma'mun al-Rashid stopped his carriage and asked, Young man, why did you not run away like the other children? Imam al taqi calmly replied, Neither have I committed a crime, nor am I blocking your way. Then why should I run away or be afraid? Ma'mun al-Rashid was surprised with this mature reply and asked, What is your name, young man? Imam al-Taqi replied by saying, My name is Muhammad. Ma'mun asked, The son of whom? The Imam replied, The son of Ali ibn Musa Ridha, peace be upon him. Ma'mun al-Rashid rode off and during his hunt, he caught a fish. On his way back, he hid the fish in his hand and saw the children playing in the same street and saw the Imam in the same spot. When he approached the Imam, he asked him, what is in my fist? Imam Muhammad al-Taqi replied, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created tiny fish in the river. The hooks of kings sometimes catch them. Ma'mun al-Rashid was surprised by this answer because Imam al-Taqi said that when the kings come to approach a young man, they asked the same question from a member of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them. Ma'mun al-Rashid said, Truly, you are the worthy son of Imam Ali ibn Musa Ridha. So for this reason, Ma'mun took the young man, Imam Muhammad al-Taqi, and let him live in a house nearby his, his royal palace. The moral of the story is that we should always and we should never be scared of anything or anyone because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the strongest and will always look after us.
Inshallah, in tonight's episode, I plan to recite a small poem in remembrance of Rasulullah, peace and blessings be upon him. It's a nasheed released by Mahar Zain originally, but it's one of my favorites, so that's why I wanted to share it with you. With submission, faith and patience, you conveyed the noble message, brought us light through your guidance. Peace be upon you, my beloved. Ya Habibi, Ya Muhammad, Ya Nabi, Salam Alaika, Ya Rasul, Salam Alaika, Ya Habib, Salam Alaika, Salawatullah Alaika. Tere mohabbat ki mehak se Ye zameen o asman abad hai Rehmat ki barsat aati hai Dil o jaan Ya Rasul Allah Ya Habibi Ya Muhammad Ya Nabi Salam alayka يا رسول سلام عليك يا حبيب سلام عليك صلوات الله عليك يا نبي سلام عليك يا رسول سلام عليك يا حبيب سلام عليك صلوات عليك أيها المختار فينا زادنا الحب عنينا جتنا بالخير دينا يا ختام المرسلين يا حبيبي يا محمد يا نبي سلام عليك يا رسول سلام عليك يا حبيب سلام عليك صلوات الله عليك يا نبي سلام عليك يا رسول سلام عليك يا حبيب سلام عليك صلوات الله عليك صلوات الله عليك The Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, was asked, O Prophet of Allah, which of the two months possesses a greater reward, Rajab or the month of Ramadan? The Holy Prophet, may the peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny, replied, Nothing can be compared to the month of Ramadan in terms of reward. As we conclude another episode of the Ramadan show, I want you to leave you with the final few words. As it's the last few nights of the month of Ramadan, I wanted these words to resonate with you. Words you can reflect over and inshallah will stay with you for the rest of the year and for the rest of your life inshallah. And those words are that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you with a specific goal in mind. And because of that goal he's given you a specific potential. Our aim in life should be to live up to that potential because not doing so means we're answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. You see, in life we come across many different sorts of people, different personality traits, different strengths and different weaknesses. We must try and use our strengths to try and achieve that potential that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So firstly, we can serve Him and secondly, by doing so, we can get closer to Him.
I would like to once again ask you humbly to send in your videos, your pictures, your blogs, so that we may be able to publish that on our television station and on our YouTube page, because that way the whole world can see how you prepare for this holy month. I would also like to ask you to please join us on social media using the hashtag IHTVRamadan. Join us on Facebook, Instagram and on YouTube, inshaAllah. Finally, I would ask you to please pray for all of us. Pray for everyone at the station, but most importantly, pray for those people in this world who are needy and the orphans and the widows. Inshallah, the most important prayer of all though, please pray for the reappearance of the awaited Imam, Ajallah Ta'ala Faraja. With these final words, I wish to bid you farewell. And that is, wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.